Hello, we are having our 11th meeting uh, organized by Association for Community Mental Health Promotion and WPA section on psychiatry, uh, medicine and primary care. Today, our guest is uh, Professor Rachel Jenkins and we have uh, Professor David Barron as our discussant and two medical students. I'm, I'm going to try to uh, introduce you our speakers. I hope there is no problem with this sharing. Do I? I think oh, we can see the presentation, but it's not in the presentation mode. We see the. Well, if I take it to, to presentation mode, uh, there may be some problem, and if it is seen, that's good enough. Yeah, right. it's, it, it can be seen. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, this is our uh, dear guest. Uh, she is a professor emeritus at King's College London, uh, a psychiatrist, epidemiologist, and mental health policymaker with over 20 years of experience working in low and middle income countries on mental health policy development and implementation research and training, especially on integration of mental health into primary care and schools. Uh, she has contributed to England's Health of the Nation strategy in 1992 and was responsible for the inclusion of mental health and the establishment of suicide prevention targets. She now sits on the National Suicide Strategy Advisory Group she established the British National Psychiatric Morbidity Survey Program running since 1992 and continues to chair the academic papers group analyzing its findings. She was the director of the WHO Collaborating Center on Mental Health Institute of Psychiatry, King's College, London, between 1997 and 2012. Uh, she was the Principal Medical Officer, Mental Health Division, Department of Health, 99, uh, 1988 to 1996. And she is Consultant and Senior Lecturer, Bart's Hospital and Medical School. And she has worked with EFID, WHO, EU, World Bank, African Development Bank, and Nuffield, uh, particularly in Africa. Middle East, Pakistan, and Russia on mental health policy implementation, training, and research, and has worked with World Federation of Mental Health, uh, World Psychiatric Association, and other international and national NGOs on a number of training initiatives and conferences. Uh, she had also visited uh, our uh, Kojiri University. She has published over 500 academic papers, her recent publications, I didn't include all. Uh, one is very important with our uh, working area, implementing mental health promotion. And uh, I want to go over these and come to David, because if we all uh, try to uh, listen to her brief uh, CV, it would uh, take all the time. And uh, David Barron, Professor David Barron, uh, he is the senior vice president and provost, uh, serves as chief academic officer of the Western University, responsible for academic accreditation and academic accreditation and budgetary affairs. Uh, Dr. Barron joined the university in May, 2018, after serving for eight years in roles within the Department of Psychiatry at the Keck School of Medicine including Vice Dean for Global Health, Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosurgery, Vice Chair of the Department and Chief of Service at uh, Keck USC Hospital. He received his DO degree from the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and a Master of Science in Education from the University of Southern California. He is the former Deputy Clinical Director of the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, former president of the American College of Neuropsychiatry and the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry, and chair the development department of 
Psychiatry at Temple University School of Medicine from 98 to 2010. Uh, he was named a National Fulbright Scholar in 2017-18 and conducted his research as Distinguished Chair in Brain Research at the University of Calgary. He also, he, he also is the recipient of a Fulbright Specialist Award for 2016-21. And he is uh, the Chair of section, in, section on Psychiatry Medicine and Primary Care of World Psychiatric Association. He has always uh, been uh, supportive of our activities. He has been here in Turkey uh, more than once. And we have two students from Turkey, uh, Miraj Nur Musaul and Hasan Sadık Maida. Uh, Miraj has uh, recently been graduated just two months ago. So we can easily call her Dr. Miraj Nur Musaul. Uh, she plans to continue her career with a neuroscience in the neuroscience PhD and residency in psychiatry. Besides, she loves art, house, movies, and yoga. And coming to uh, the other uh, medical student, he is a fourth year medical student at Karadeniz Technical University Faculty of Medicine. He took many national and international duties in many student societies, such as uh, European Medical Students Association and International Federation of Medical Students Association. He has he is being uh, helpful for our uh, NGO uh, to have some connects with these uh, with the other students. And he is the founder and president of the Karadeniz Surgery Interest Society Club, affiliated with the American College of Surgeons. Of course. Uh, and here is uh, me. Uh, I'm the chair of the executive board of Association for Community Mental Health Promotion, co-chair of WPA section and PMPC, and a retired faculty of Kojeri University Psychiatry Department. And I think now I can stop sharing if I can manage to do that. Uh, I hope I will. Uh, where am I going? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now uh, it took so many, so much time, but uh, our guests are uh, so uh, valuable or invaluable. They are. Uh, we are proud to have them uh, among us, and our young colleagues uh, have also been very active, uh, and will be doing much in the future. Rachel, uh, may we uh, have your presentation, please? Thank you for being with us. Thank you for asking me, Bulent. Um, let's just hope this works. There we go. Um, now. Thank you. There we, we can, go. We can so, see. can you? Is that full screen? Yes. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much for asking me. Um, this arose because um, we had a discussion amongst the Seed Group um, a week or two ago about the link between physical and mental health, and I put together some slides which we didn't show. So um, it was suggested that I um, I show them now. Now the slides are not new, so as you can see from the um, the rather out of date um, caption at the bottom, um, they were put together um, nearly twenty years ago, probably, for some teaching materials um, that we put together for frontline health workers. So, um, particularly in Africa, these are often nurses or clinical officers with a three year um, training. And it was these slides that I just thought might be helpful for medical students to set out the kind of background to the links between physical and mental health. And they come from a 40 hour continuing professional development course um, for frontline health workers, um, the core of which is, um, is the fourth module, which is based on um, the first 
WHO primary care guidelines for assessment, um, diagnosis and management, which I think was the brainchild of Norman Sartorius before he left WHO. But the, um, the committee that put them together was chaired by Bedahan Ooston, um, who many of you will know. And for the last year that it met, it consisted of some um, frontline health workers, I think GPs plus psychiatrists largely at that time. And for the last year, they met in my office which in the Department of Health, the Ministry of Health in, the, in London. And this was how I kind of knew it was happening. So when I left our ministry and moved to direct the WHO Collaborating Centre at the Institute of Psychiatry, um, Bedahan Houston first of all asked me to adapt these WHO primary care guidelines um, for the UK. So I think they were launched in about 96 and, um, and we produced them first of all for the UK in about 2002, I think. And then in 2004, I got a grant to train um, Kenya's frontline health workers in mental health with a 40 hour CPD training program. So um, some East African colleagues came to my office for about um, a week or two. We had a workshop um, adapting these WHO guidelines specifically for the East Africa and the um, the um, specific um, assessment, diagnosis and management um, 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 sort of, um, content of that um, became the fourth module in my training program. So I'm not going to show you that. Um, the th third module was neurological disorders. The second module was um, um, specific skills and competences for frontline health workers. But the parts that I'm going to show you come from the first and the last module. Now the first module was core concepts about mental health, physical health, then the Millennium Development Goals, um, but now of course the Sustainable Development Goals. And the fifth module was really about policy, um, general health policy and mental health policy and the linkages between mental health and both communicable and non-communicable disease. So it's some of those slides that I'm also going to, um, to show. So um, with that background, um, we'll, we'll make a start. Um, so these were some of the first contextual slides, if you like. So the biopsychosocial causes of mental illness, which you're all kind of familiar with, so the social, the psychological, and the physical causes. Now, today we're not going to talk particularly about social causes, uh, but of course we should be talking about the social aspects of mental health because it's very intertwined. Um, but tonight the discussion is about the physical and the mental. So that's what I'll focus on. And so there are obviously psychological causes of mental illness plus the physical, um, communicable, non-communicable disease, and trauma can all contribute to, um, to mental disorder. Um, and then of course we have the biopsychosocial consequences of mental illness. When I was in the um, Department of Health in the UK, my boss at the time used to call this my death and destruction paragraph because I would always wheel it out when I was trying to persuade ministers about the huge importance of mental health and the terrible consequences of mental illness if we didn't treat it properly. So thinking about the suffering, the disability, um, mortality, not just from suicide, but also from premature um, death from physical illnesses that uh, come with mental illness and that often we don't detect and treat properly. The, um, the social consequences like losing a job, sorry, or not um, um, working to full capacity at work, and the poverty that comes from being in um, a low paid job or not being able to hold down a job at all, or from the family having to support somebody with mental illness. The stress on the carer, you'll know that anybody looking after um, somebody with mental illness um, 
has um, terrific stresses to um, to cope with. And we know that carers tend to have um, um, GHQ scores double those of the general population. Um, mental illness can often lead to marital breakdown. Um, the damage to children, um, of course, is enormous. Um, the intellectual, the emotional damage, and also children don't develop um, so well physically as well if, um, if um, either they or their parents are, have a mental disorder. And you get a cycle of disadvantage across the generations. Um, our physical health programs um, struggle to, um, to be successful in the face of, of mental illness. So we know, for example, from studies in Pakistan, that mothers with postnatal depression have higher rates of mortality in their young children because they're not so good at managing infant diarrhea um, and managing rehydration and so on. So, so the consequences are, um, are enormous across both mental, physical health and um, social welfare. So if we now think about um, you know, the WHO definition of health, that it's a state of mental, physical, and so with each other. And mental health influences whether we're susceptible to and whether we, we recover from physical disease and physical health influences our susceptibility and whether we recover from mental disorders as well. Um, if we think about how mental health impacts on physical health, by causing illness, it can worsen prognosis, it can make pain worse. Um, continued stress and emotional disturbances can cause physical illness. We often know people in our families or friends who've developed a physical illness after major stresses. Um, the presence of psychological symptoms can result in a poor prognosis of physical illness. So for example, it's very important to know that depression greatly worsens the prognosis of heart attacks and cancer. Um, it's very important to treat depression um, in, um, in people with those. Um, Mental disorder can exacerbate physical disease. It seems to lower the threshold to pain. And um, conversely, physical health has a big impact on mental health. So um, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and so on, um, often result in depression. Um, possibly for psychological reasons, the anxiety about the illness, but also possibly through um, physical mechanisms as well. Um, we're familiar with the side effects of some treatments for physical illness. So for example, steroids are the classic one, um, which can, um, uh, in, sorry, this shouldn't be included, induce mental disorders such as depression and psychosis. But there are other medicines that will do the same. Um, also, there's often diagnostic confusion between mental and physical illness. So physical illness can present with mental symptoms and mental illness can present with physical symptoms that have no organic basis. Um, but people with known mental illness are much more likely to have their real physical health ignored by health professionals. Health professionals are still too often thinking only in one dimension. And this is very dangerous. And it's one of the big reasons why people with mental illness um, die prematurely of physical illnesses because they've been ignored. So when we think about mental symptoms of physical disease, um, some mental symptoms are symptoms of a physical disease. So all men medical students are hopefully taught about thyrotoxicosis that can present in the primary care clinic as an acute anxiety state but all well-trained doctors would do a thyroid function test. Likewise, depression um, can um, result from myxedema, um, memory loss, feeling fatigued, depressed, um, feeling slowed up, disinclined to um, undertake even familiar tasks. It's often a sign of a poorly functioning thyroid. Um, diabetes um, can present with listlessness, irritability, and confusion, and so on. 
So it's very important to be alert to these, these issues. If we take the example of electrolyte imbalance from renal failure, um, this can present with a variety of um, psychological symptoms, depending on what the electrolyte status is. Um, and then we're all familiar with these physical symptoms of depression. People present in primary care with headache, backache, stomach ache. Um, in, um, in East Africa, people talk about happen here and here. Um, people are feeling generally very unwell and come into the clinic. Um, so how do we handle this complexity? Um, and the only solution seems to me really is to stop thinking uniaxially. We need all our health workers to think in multiple dimensions, um, physically, psychologically, and socially. There are causes um, of, um, of illness, which are physical, psychological, and social. There are presentations that are multidimensional, consequences that are multidimensional. And so our management plans also need to be multidimensional. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about this premature physical mortality of mental illness. Because it's a scandal, really. It's a scandal that we're all implicated in. People with mental illness, we all know there's a premature, there's a mortality from suicide. But there's an, a mortality that's just as bad from physical illness. People with mental illness are dying much too soon from infectious diseases, respiratory illness, cardiovascular disease, malignancies, and other trauma. And, um, and at least part of the reason for that is because we're not good at being multi-axial and at treating physical illness properly in people with mental illness. Um, poverty, uh, of course, just bringing in a social environmental factor here, um, can lead to, um, to illness, um, can lead to unhealthy lifestyles. So the, um, the complexity of the interaction is, uh, needs to be biopsychosocial. I'll just skip some of this. So that's some um, kind of basic concepts, really. Now I wanted to move to um, thinking about reproductive health, child health, um, HIV and malaria, which I'm going to cover. <laughs> so thinking about, sorry, is that? Oh. Um, so thinking about reproductive health first, um, ministries of health um, in their reproductive health policy, they generally think about family planning, safe motherhood and child survival, um, management of um, sexually transmitted diseases, um, promotion of adolescent and youth health, management of infertility, um, gender issues and reproductive rights, and integration of services and quality of care. So these tend to be the various components of Ministry of Health policy on reproductive health. So I'm going to go through each of those and discuss how mental health is important to each of those um, and needs to be included. So if we think about family planning, for example, depressed women, we know are less likely to access family planning services. Um, Aggressive and substance using men are less likely to agree to condoms. Um, and this can be an issue for, um, for many um, populations. Um, depressed mothers are less likely to be good at accessing the antenatal and postnatal care. Um, they may not be good at taking their folate and iron through pregnancy, not so good at getting their infants immunized. And I already mentioned this problem of managing the oral rehydration of infant diarrhea, which is a very important skill, um, particularly in low and middle income countries. Mothers can get depressed after hysterectomies and abortion and stillbirths. And of course, if mothers um, become psychotic through the pregnancy or the childbirth, this can substantially affect the care of the child and even the subsequent relationship with the child. 
um, we think about uh, the management of sexually transmitted diseases, we know that depressed adults have lower immunity, they might be less likely to comply with the treatment so you can get chronic less likely to attend clinics. Um, but of course, people with STDs do need prompt treatment to avoid social isolation, depression, being suicidal and even um, psychotic. We think about promotion of adolescent and youth health. Um, depressed young people are less able to be assertive and safe, um, sexually safe. Unprotected sex leads to unwanted pregnancies, abortions, complications um, and STDs um, can totally damage a young girl's um, life and life chances thereafter. Um, and substance abuse in young people um, can predispose to unsafe sex, um, sexually transmitted diseases and uh, unwanted pregnancy. Um, so it's really important to think about integrating services. Um, mental health, I hope I've shown, is intrinsic to reproductive health. The services need to be integrated, both at primary and secondary care levels. And um, menopause can cause stress and depression. When I first um, ran these slides to um, some um, um, nursing lecturers in Kenya, they all said, aha, you must include the andropause as well. It's very um, depressing for men too. Um, and then management of infertility. Um, depressed young women are more vulnerable to chlamydia because of not um, using condoms and, um, and have lower immunity as well. And of course, then chlamydia could contribute to infertility later on. And women who are unable to have children, particularly in low income countries, are often considered social misfits. They're isolated and discriminated against, leading to stress, depression, um, suicide, or, um, or sometimes promiscuity. Um, and when we think about issues and reproductive rights, um, Men who abuse substances, personality disordered or depressed, um, we know are more likely to commit domestic violence, psychological and sexual abuse. Um, in a number of countries, female genital mutilation is very common, as you know, and the victims of FGM experience stress, depression, um, great difficulty in childbirth, the damage to the child um, as it comes through the birth canal, um, stillbirths and depression. Um, rape can lead to unwanted pregnancies, abortions and depression, um, and domestic violence um, precipitated by substance abuse, precipitated by anything will lead to um, depression. Um, depression and anxiety can increase the likelihood of smoking, um, poor antenatal care, problems with breastfeeding, um, in malarial countries, a lack of treated bed nets. It's often the woman's job to um, keep the bed nets well treated. And if she's depressed, she's less likely to do that. Um, mentioned unsafe sex, um, poor self-assertion to combat violence and abuse. Um, complaints of vaginal discharge are often the clue to depression or concern about sexual problems. You'll know that in uh, pre-menopausal women, um, a vaginal discharge is perfectly normal. And, um, and often women present in primary care complaining about it. And um, it can be a good indicator of depression. And in many countries, menopausal symptoms are not well understood. And this can lead to, um, to stress for the women who are, are menopausal. Um, so that's those are my slides on the links between reproductive health and mental health and an argument that the, um, the clinics need to be integrated. Um, thinking about policy on child health now, the core policy components here are what's called IMCI, the Integrated Management of Childhood Illnesses, um, the need to strengthen our health system, so they're good at this, 
and promoting adolescent and youth health is the policy component that it shares with reproductive health. So thinking about the integrated management of childhood illnesses, um, childhood emotional and conduct disorders are associated with malnutrition, trauma and physical illness. Um, childhood physical illnesses have psychological, cognitive and social consequences for the child. So management should always be holistic, always biopsychosocial. Physically ill children often have depressed mothers. Um, if you go and walk around a paediatric ward with mothers sitting next to their child's bedside and have a good look, and look very depressed. I and mean, obviously the mother is going to be anxious about their child, but they often look very depressed as well. So often it's important to assess and treat the mother as well as the child. Um, thinking about adolescent and youth health, um, the children of depressed mothers are less likely to be immunized, be well nourished. Often they're kept at home and don't go to school, have a poor school attendance. So the consequences of childhood mental illness and behavioral problems are very great. Um, low academic chances afterwards. Adult psychiatric problems. We know that untreated childhood disorders persist into adult life. Um, there can be unwanted pregnancies, um, might be criminal behavior. Um, personality traits which can handicap in the labor market. Um, lack of healthy lifestyles, and of course, an impact on the health of the next generation. When these children grow up, have their own children and are not um, as successful parents. So very important to support the parents as well as the children. Depre treat depressed mothers. We had a very famous um, um, psychiatrist at the Maudsley who died many years ago now, now Professor Chani Kumar, who once said to me in the um, Institute Canteen when he knew I was interested in prevention of mental illness, he said, Rachel, the most important thing you can do to prevent mental illness is treat depressed mothers. And he was probably right um, that um, because they um, in, have the key to the um, future generation. We need to integrate um, our holistic management of childhood illnesses and, um, and address them promptly um, so they don't persist into adult life. So those um, are two examples really of non-communicable issues, reproductive health and child health. I'm going to talk about two examples of um, communicable disease now. Um, malaria, first of all, I mentioned already that good mental health can contribute to um, um, active use of treated bed nets um, for the family um, to keep the mosquitoes at bay at night, um, having good control um, of the mosquitoes around the house. And we know increasingly over the last few years that good mental health is really good for immunity. And these chemical cytokines circulating in the bloodstream that help fight infection. Whereas poor mental health, conversely, depressed people are less likely to use treated bed nets, they have lowered immunity, and less likely to comply adequately with treatment regimes for themselves and their children. So you can get resistance to the medicines as well. There's a lot of diagnostic confusion in malarial countries between malaria and depression. Um, there was a study run by the Welcome in Kenya um, a number of years ago now, looking at all the referrals to the district hospitals from primary care. Um, and this was at the time when they didn't have um, access to up-to-date tests. Um, they just had to do it on clinical presentation. And what the, um, what, this, that's the primary care staff um, who were making the referrals. And what the district hospitals found when they did the confirmatory blood tests was that in fact, only 10% of the suspected malaria referred to the district hospitals actually was malaria. 90% of it wasn't. 
And at that stage, they didn't assess the 90% for depression, anxiety, and so on. But I would lay money that a very large proportion of them had that. Um, so and when people have looked at the data in health centers in Kenya, nobody at the primary care level um, at that stage was being diagnosed with depression um, on a routine basis by their primary care staff, despite um, when research studies were done, finding that the prevalence of depression in primary care was actually around 30 to 40 percent of attenders. And in fact, they were diagnosed with malaria instead. And the reasons for that are because of what we were saying earlier about these physical presentations for depression. Depressed people often present with headache, aches and pains, and general feeling of being unwell. And in rich countries, such people are often diagnosed as going down with flu or something. And in um, low income countries, if malaria is rife, they're often diagnosed as having malaria despite having a normal blood film and no fever. It's as if the health worker, if they haven't been attuned to um, depression, um, are stuck, uh, not clear what to do. So they treat it as for malaria or sometimes for typhoid um, or amoebiasis. You sometimes find such a physical illness. Now, the consequences of having this wrong diagnosis of malaria are, um, are pretty serious, really. Um, the use of repeated antimalarials when they're not necessary can contribute to resistance. It can even reduce immun immunity by removing low-grade parasitemia from adults who um, would otherwise not get actual clinical malaria. And of course, it greatly adds to the primary care workload because the patient keeps coming back to the clinic because their so-called malaria has not improved. Anti-malarials are not a good treatment for depression. So the workload in primary care is greatly aggravated by repeat consultations of people presenting with physical symptoms when in fact they have a psychological disorder. And it adds to the costs incurred by unnecessary extra investigations and expensive new drugs as well. So just to summarize the various diagnostic overlaps, um, most adults uh, with depression don't have malaria, um, but in countries where there is malaria, they're often erroneously treated for the malaria unless the health workers are actually using um, up-to-date PCR tests, which increasingly they do now. Some adults with depression will also have malaria, they'll have both. And some adults who know have got malaria will also be depressed. And some adults with psychotic symptoms are in fact delirious from malaria, cerebral malaria, um, from cerebral malaria. And some adults with actual psychosis will also have malaria. So you can see the options are, um, are quite complex. Um, these are the possible associations that it's possible to have. So we need our health workers in the front line to be smart about this and to be thinking through um, what it is that's in front of them. So I think the solution is this accurate biopsychosocial assessment. If the person cites, they should always be assessed for depression. And um, in adults, one should integrate the malaria diagnostic process um, for adults with attention to identification treatment for children. Generally for depression, generally for children, the advice has um, generally been to always treat malaria symptoms in children with antimalarials, because it's better to be mistaken than run the risk of cerebral malaria in a child. So that was just to indicate some of the complexity of the association between um, um, mental disorders and malaria. And I may say that um, a few years ago, um, we did an epidemiological study near um, Lake Victoria in Kenya, which is a malarial area. And we found that um, immunity cytokine seems to mediate the association that we found between malaria and depression. 
Um, so the, the research is getting more and more exciting in this area to try and understand the associations, really. Um, now, moving on to HIV. Um, I think this figure is out of date, um, and I'm not quite sure what the figure is at the moment. Um, and, um, and HIV, of course, um, the... Um, the new treatments, the ARBs, have had a massive impact. So, um, so the prog prognosis is now much, much more optimistic than it was. Um, mental health influences sexual behaviour and hence prevention of HIV. Um, it's a major influence on our behaviour and substance abuse, psychological conditions and so on can influence risk behaviours for getting infected with HIV. We know that mental health influences our immunity, um, our emotions, beliefs and relationships with others and our behaviour can influence our immune system. Um, Long-term stress suppresses the immune system and uh, reduces our ability to fight off infections, whether they're viral or bacterial or parasitic. Um, we know that mental health can influence the prognosis of HIV, um, one's belief systems, um, and grief um, can trigger um, a decrease in, in immunity as well. And we all know people when they've had a major loss um, can um, often be vulnerable to, um, to illness afterwards. Um, mental health promotion, on the other hand, we know improves the prognosis of HIV. So having trusted um, supporters can really boost one's immune system. Um, Self-assertion can promote the strength of the um, natural killer cell, um, cells in the immune system. And all these usual good things really help immunity. Um, good sleep, nutrition, physical exercise, um, breathing well, and so on. There are multiple ways in which HIV can damage mental health. So the psychological impact of having the illness, um, the problems that emerge from the life circumstances that result from um, being HIV positive, um, getting depressed and um, or abusing substances. We know that the virus um, after infection can go straight to the brain. So there can be actual neurological changes in the physical and chemical structure of the central nervous system. And at a late stage, there may be opportunistic um, infections. Um, there's um, the AIDS dementia complex. So people with HIV can get uh, an earlier onset dementia. And there can be other um, bacterial infections of the brain and tumors as well. There are psychological issues at the stage of diagnosis. Um, so um, um, being told that one's positive for HIV um, can lead to acute stress, feeling suicidal, um, substance abuse, possibly social isolation. Um, poor coping strategies might suppress the immune system and the um, a fear of the stigma might lead one not to um, tell your friends um, and family and so on. And there may be a feeling of betrayal from one's um, sexual partner. Um, after the diagnosis, um, people might be either anticipating or actually experiencing stigma. Their relationship um, patterns may well change. They may feel very isolated still. Um, the um, they may be less able to work. Um, for some people, there might be um, difficulties in accessing the, um, the treatments. They may feel very helpless and alienated. So um, there are psychological interventions, um, pre and post counseling for the test, and a number of um, educational, um, psychoeducational um, social skills um, supports um, social support's very important um, and self-help groups. So we are very important to be biopsychosocial um, 
I, as you see, I kind of majored on malaria and HIV, but you can think your way through other uh, non-communicable diseases as well in the same way. And likewise, um, we emphasize reproductive health and child health, but you could do the same thing for things like asthma and diabetes and heart disease and so on. So thank you for listening. And um, yes, um, I'd be interested in your um, thoughts and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Rachel. Uh, I am sure it will be a resource for the forum in, uh, for future. Our medical students uh, will refer to this presentation. Uh, there would be some uh, questions uh, to ask you, but before that, May we uh, start listening to David uh, to see his uh, reactions or comments. Uh, can we listen to you, David? Yes, and I want to keep mine uh, fairly brief because I do want to hear from our students and anyone else on the call. First, I want to uh, thank Rachel for just a, a really nice overview, um, bringing in her, her many, many decades of experience in this uh, and condensing it into 45 minutes is never an easy task. She and I are both consultation liaison psychiatrists, so we've dedicated our lives to this field. But a couple of the comments I'd like to make on, on the presentation, other than you know, its relevance, is uh, I'd like to underscore a point Rachel made that um, it's, she's talked about when she spoke to the audience, speaking to what was relevant to them. So when she was speaking to ministers, she talked about the savings associated with this. And I think this is so important that when we speak to each other in the mental health field, we make a lot of assumptions or, or we know that we kind of agree on the important role of mental health and mental well-being, but it's not always the same. And we know this very well from the ongoing stigma that still exists with patients with mental illness. So I want to underscore the important point that Rachel made that know who you're speaking to. If you're speaking to a cardiologist, don't use a lot of what we might call psychobabble. I don't throw out a lot of diagnostic terms, but speak, as Rachel said at the end of her talk, talk about the patient rather than putting a label on symptoms, you know, saying, well, this patient's depressed or psychotic or has access to disorder, which they might not really understand. Talk about, as Rachel said, you know, this patient seems to have issues with their sleep, with their relationships. We can describe the symptoms that we see as being relevant to their health. And we brought this up in our seed meeting uh, a few weeks ago that Rachel talked about, which I thought was just an excellent meeting, and the idea of how we use words. When we're speaking to each other, we can use DSM-5 or ICD-11, whatever, but I think it becomes really important, and Rachel and I know this, and we, I know we'd both like to share it with the audience, that as a liaison psychiatrist, we need to know, first and foremost, what does the consulting psychiatrist, uh, or consulting physician, one, internist, surgeon, but also when we're dealing outside of the medical field is understanding the needs and kind of making sure that we're talking about that key point that I'm so happy that Rachel ended with is we treat the patient. Can we ever imagine a diabetologist telling a diabetic patient, well, let's just worry about getting your dose of insulin correct. And that's all that matters. No, that, that would be a very bad endocrinologist. A good endocrinologist says, yes, your insulin dose is important, but so is your weight, your diet, your stress levels. So I think we can use medical models that demonstrate, as I think Rachel did uh, so nicely here, it's not just about a patient feeling better. Like, well, yeah, it's good that my, my patient with end-stage cardiac disease isn't so depressed, but I think what we need to do is exactly as Rachel underscored, and that's the direct relationship that in fact, mental health and physical health are not separate entities, they're not separate buckets. They're really all one and the same. It's a different set of symptoms. And as we learn more and more from the field of psychoneuroimmunology, we're getting good science behind this. And I, again, I'd wanna underscore an area of research I did when I was at the NIMH was looking at psychoneuroimmunology or the effects of stress on the immune system. And as Rachel pointed out, it affects every single aspect of our immune system. Natural killer cell number, activity, uh, cytokines, chemokines, there, there's not one portion of the immune response 
that isn't affected by anxiety and depression. And there's a very robust literature on that. So when we talk to people, it's not about talking about their mental health. It's really just talking about their health and their quality of life. So uh, I, I think what we need to do, and we discussed this, and, and then I wanna stop and get feedback, is we need to be very cautious of the language we use, understanding that stigma still exists. People think that only crazy people get depressed or get anxious. I think what one of the one possible minor silver linings of the COVID uh, cloud will be that people now understand that a lot of people get anxious and depressed who aren't quote crazy people, whatever that disparaging term might mean, that this is a part of human existence and this biopsychosocial, and they're not three separate legs of the chair. There are three components of the same leg. And we need to conceptualize that and that every good physician needs to understand if they're not looking at what the underlying emotional state is, whether they're psychopathology or reaction to you know, uh, environmental stresses and, and Rachel touched on a, a, a number of these, you are not gonna be as good a physician. You're not gonna be as effective as a caregiver, whether you're a nurse or a community mental health worker uh, Rachel talked about the importance of taking things into the community. And I think well, that we've, we've known this for a long time. We really need to start acting on this, that we need to go out just like we develop health maintenance programs in the community. We need to do the same with mental health. And she gave some wonderful examples with her women's mental health and adolescent mental health, that if we keep it restricted to our inpatient psych facilities or inpatient large medical centers, we're really only ca catching maybe the tip of the iceberg and that what we really need to do is get involved with public policy. And as we talk about translational, not just being bench to bedside, but really molecules to Main Street. What are we learning at a molecular level? And then how does that affect public policy? And Rachel, as many of you might know, has really been one of, one of the real, um, uh, I'll say godmothers of the field in making sure that people understood that what we do is part, it's not mental health, it's really health and it's the mental symptoms. And as we're looking at all the work we're seeing now in the area of the inflammasome, for example, not just beyond the immune system, which is probably, you know, everything's all interrelated as we know, but there's really, it might well be that the students on the call and the future students will really look at, at mental illness in a very different way. Uh, that what is the impact of the gut microbiome on depression, there's some really wonderful work that's been coming out now for probably a good five to 10 years, and it's getting more and more elegant as we're able to look at the brain, as we're able to look at the brain in a way that it's not just at an autopsy, but with advanced neuroimaging techniques. And, and I think what we're gonna see is the more we learn, the more people will say, well, of course, this isn't just mental health or health, it's health. It's the mental component of that. So with that long-winded, I'd, I'd really like to turn it over to questions or comments from our students. Again, I wanna thank Rachel for a wonderful overview. And uh, I think we all need to take the charge. Students on up to the gray beards like Bulant and I, um, to make sure that our, our efforts should be not to try to tell people, you should listen to what we say because we're important. That we shouldn't have that Rodney Dangerfield mentality, which we say that we get no respect in psychiatry. No, we're important health providers, subspecialists in the area of mental health, and that we need to work with, as Rachel has made her career, as I've tried to make a good deal of my career, working with our colleagues in health delivery, other physicians, other healthcare providers, so that they can understand this importance and, in fact, provide the highest quality health, safety, and well being for those that we're caring for. So uh, Bulan, let me kick it back to you and let's open up to our students for some comments and then hopefully some questions. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for your contributions. I remember something which I haven't done at the beginning, uh, recording. Uh, although it's recorded on uh, YouTube, but with your permission, I'm going to at least the discussions uh, run by our uh, young colleagues. Uh, Miraj, may we start with you? Uh, yes, uh, I also would like to start. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rachel Jenkins and Dr. David Farrell for your great points. Uh, I, I get really inspired by your presentations and your uh, like discussion points. And today, by coincidence, I like uh, read an article in uh, Guardian, which is uh, complaining about separation between physical and mental health, uh, which is also like 
underlined during COVID era that's like a person suffering from long COVID symptoms, also suffering from some like foggy brains and sort of things. And also realize that not just in the primary care, also in the secondary care, physical and mental health care facilities are really separated from each other. And this is a really big problem for both healthcare workers and for, for from the perspective of patients as well. And that's the point that I realized today suddenly that, that this should be together because physical and mental health symptoms really run together. They are both etiologically and symptomatologically and also in the prognosis, they really affect each other in association with each other. So this presentation, I think it's really important and it made really good points uh, from both uh, like perspective of uh, reproductive health, adolescent health, and also for infectious diseases, mental health is also has uh, impacts on the transmission, the prevention, and the prognosis of infectious diseases. I think this was also a great point to see, which uh, with, with in the in the presentation. Um, so thank you very much for those. And also, uh, as a like aspiring psychiatrist, I would like to also pursue a career in neuroscience, where I also want to investigate biological pathways. And I believe that those pathways will reveal uh, how those physical and mental uh, disorders really connected with each other and uh, like uh, causing and affecting from uh, their prognosis as well. I think it's it's also a very important point that David, uh, Dr. David Barron also uh, really highlighted in, in his speech, uh, which was also very inspiring for me. Uh, th that's all from me. I don't have an exact question yet, but thank you very much for your uh, for the discussion and presentation. Thank you, thank you a lot, Miraj. And now uh, we will go to Hassan. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you for your educational and uh, informative speech, Dr. Jenkins. And um, I have a question, but before that, um, as a young um, medical student, we, uh, and I have to know that there is a no illness, there is a patient approach and inspired me about this approach. And um, I wanna ask some educational uh, questions because we need to bring this approach to a uh, new generation uh, of ducks. And so uh, you tell about holistic management of patients treatment. So I wanna ask, um, do you think that the issue of holistic management of uh, patient is Adequacy addressed in medical faculties? No. <laughs> in a word, no. Um, I mean, I think um, I, I'm sure it's well addressed when David Barron is teaching, um, <laughs> but in um, and when Bulent is teaching. Um, but in many places, of course, it isn't. And we still have our colleagues who do not address it well. And so um, I know in the UK, we have a, quite a problem at the moment because a lot of our primary care doctors seem to think that they are doctors from the neck downwards, you know, and anything to do with the head, they will refer. <laughs> um, I even have a problem with my eye, left eye at the moment, which has um, some kind of allergic reaction or little infection or something. And my GP even tried to send me to an optician for that <laughs> rather than deal with it himself. So it's as if they only do the chin downwards, you know. Um, and I think it's a failure of our training in medical schools at the moment um, that people are seeing mental health as like a pimple on the side of mainstream medicine. And you might pay attention to it if you've got time or the inclination, but it's optional rather than as actually core business, you know. And um, I think our colleagues need to get back to teaching it as core business. Um, and um, and we're, um, I don't think we're winning the battle at the moment. Yeah, I'd just like to pick up, because I couldn't agree more with Rachel and I haven't seen a whole lot of improvement um, over the years. One of the things that I did when at one of my prior institutions where I was chair back in Philadelphia at Temple University 
is I literally changed the name of the course for the first year. It used to be Introduction to Psychiatry. We changed it to the role of mental health in the practice of medicine. Um, because people saw the word psychiatrist. So I'm not gonna be a psychiatrist. If I see a psych patient, I'm just gonna refer them. So I think we really have to do a paradigm shift. And I couldn't agree more with Rachel. And it's been frustrating for me in my 40 years career and, and Bulan and Rachel, we've all been in, you know, have seen, there's been very little movement. We, I worked very hard. We had a family medicine residency and I kind of required when I got into the Dean's role that, um, that they, they must have a primary care uh, within the primary care training, there must be a dedicated time for mental health. And we call it psychiatry there, but I think we need to integrate it into the training. And I think your question really addresses a key issue moving forward is how can we expand where this, the, what we're talking about today, this is just a part of every medical education, every medical student around the world gets. Because until we do that, I think we're going to make at best baby steps and maybe one step forward and two steps back. So I think that needs to be, Boulant and I particularly have worked on WPA on the education section for many years. And I know Rachel's done this in the UK and around the world. I think really the first important step that we really need to address in changing the culture is changing the exposure to this and making sure, as Rachel said, well, maybe I'll go to the psych lectures or maybe I won't. It's more important to study cardiology for the exam. Psych's not important. We really need to change that culture that if you want to be a good physician, you better make sure that you're wide awake and alert to every one of those uh, sessions. So I think that, that that's something that your generation is uh, that, that our generation, we've not done as good a job as I wish we could have in changing the way our field and this topic particularly is presented to medical students and not just in the clinics, but starting at the very beginning of medical education or even before. I mean, you've been talking about it, you know, uh, you know when you're giving lectures in, in, in secondary school, talking about this, that this is a, this is health. It's not mental health and physical health, it's health. Here are the mental components, here are the physical components, but again, three components of the same leg, not three separate uh, legs. Thanks, Dr. Um, and I have uh, two questions also. And does VPA have a policy paper about holistic management of uh, patient treatment? And do you think um, WPA have to uh, should prepare on a post paper about this situation. Uh, I can't hear you, right, Dr. Jenkins? Yeah, was that question for David? Um, uh, to my, who is? Or to me, sorry, I, I, I didn't know. properly hear the question, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I did not. Does World Psychiatric Association have a post paper about uh, holistic management of uh, patient treatment. Treatments. I don't know. Do you know, David? Yeah. Um, so the WPA, uh, again, remember who have been the leaders of WPA? Norman Sartorius. You know, there's no one who's probably done more when he was at WHO. So the WHO, uh, um, you know, has followed his lead. The WPA has been very committed to this topic. I, I can't think. Of, of a president, and I've been involved with the organization for quite a number of years now, that, but I, 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 what I think we failed, and I say that, and again, as a member of the education section for many years, Blunt well, was a, a leader in that section, is I don't think we've actually achieved what, what we would have liked to, and based on our, just the discussion we just had, that uh, the WPA clearly has been concerned with stigma issues, the role of psychiatry um, in the practice of medicine, uh, our section uh, that Boulant and I chair, you know, the psychiatry, medicine, and primary care. So it's been there, but I don't think we've executed. I think we would have to honestly say there's been somewhat of a failure. We've talked to ourselves about it. We've talked to our students, but I think our impact has been relatively minor. Um, and it's not for lack of effort, but I think it's, I, you know, for, we, we need a, a better strategy. Again, uh, Rachel and I and Boulant's generation we as CL psychiatrists have been talking about this for quite a long time now, but we've made, I would say minimal progress if I was gonna be brutally honest. So I think we need to uh, stop saying like, well, listen to us because what we're saying is important. Uh, we need to integrate, we need to focus on that liaison part of CL and liaison with uh, healthcare providers of various specialties, of policymakers, 
And I think it's an ongoing effort, but one that um, hopefully your generation will do a better job in solving than ours has. Maybe uh, we can acknowledge uh, Dr. Diva now uh, as, a, as a person who had uh, given his life to education and primary care. Uh, he has underlined all the possible ways uh, to bring together uh, these different issues. And as David, you have said, uh, he was also trying to use the word mental health rather than psychiatry. And instead of psychosis, he uh, used to say we should uh, try to reach the students uh, with their uh, everyday problems, such as stress and other issues. Uh, he has passed away uh, a few months ago, but He's a, he was a good leader indeed. I just wanted to mention. Yeah, no, and I just came back from uh, Malaysia where he, and Borneo where he worked and visited some of the clinics that he started. So his legacy goes on. But I really think the challenge will fall on you. The students on here, um, that we are always here, uh, Bulat, and I've always said it's you our future. And that, that is so true. And in this area, here's an area where we are all here, Rachel Blunt, many others, um, you know, who we're here to support you and share our successes, but really share a lot of our failures in this. And I'm, I believe we have failed in many areas, not because we haven't tried, but I think it's gonna be up to your generation. And maybe now with social media and the Zooms that we can do things, you know, we can get together now without traveling halfway around the world to meet each other, that maybe there'll be advantages, but I believe this will be the challenge um, and an important challenge of the next generation of psychiatrists, and that's doing a better job of integrating what we've known for a very, I mean, listen, how long did it take us? We knew for 50 years that smoking was terrible for your health. How long did it take to change that culture? It didn't happen. All the data in the world didn't change it. It really took a lot of time and effort, but I think we have turned a bit of a corner if you look at smoking. I mean, it's still there, but a, a lot better than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. So um, I think it will fall on your generation. We're here to help you. Uh, we're here to help you do your work, but I think it's critical if we are really committed to providing the highest quality of overall health, quality of life and well-being. I think it takes a lot of advocacy from, yeah. the, um, from the mental health people really um, to keep um, arguing for it and not to give up. So, um, so one of the things that um, we um, we taught in many of our trainings was kind of role plays about advocating, arguing to get yourself on the committee that was, say, doing district health plans or doing curriculum or something, making sure that the health people were in there and include you know these are life skills that are not generally taught in medical school or in nursing colleges but they're terribly important um, through later life to make sure that mental health is always um, part of the picture I suppose um, so um, so that's what I would say I wanted to also remember um, well, David Goldberg is still alive, but he was um, a stupendous yeah. teacher yes. and he was responsible for training many medical students at Manchester. And if you visited the area around Manchester, uh, the GPs there used to shine like beacons, <laughs> um, but they're all of an age where they've retired now and um, it's more difficult to um, to come across them. Um, but yes, an inspired teacher can make an enormous difference to generations. Yeah, yeah. Linda Gask was one of his students that That's Bulan right. and I wrote a book together yeah. on, on this yeah. topic, and uh, David was a, a valuable contributor to that. And just a quick vignette to underscore Rachel's point. When I did my Fulbright, it was up in Canada, and I, I do a lot of work in youth sports concussion, and we knew that there was a big issue about uh, body checking in hockey and youth and a number of issues and the way we were able to get the government to change the rules wasn't based on the data on their school performance and a whole. It was we were able to demonstrate they could save $1,700 per, per athlete by putting this rule change in. And, by, and we were able to get the data on health costs. So 
again, I think advocating, but making sure that when we go to advocate, and I couldn't agree more, is we're speaking the language that makes sense to them. You know, why should they listen to us? They say, well, you're a psychiatrist. Of course, you're worried about depression, and anxiety. But so I think, and we do have the data and we can advocate in a way that it's going to be meaningful. And this is one of the things that I've, that when I deal with public health officials, when I deal with foreign governments, ministers of health, I just came back with dealing with some ministers of health and sport is what I, I have to understand why, how can I make this relevant for them? And it's usually saving money, morbidity and mortality, racial change, some very interesting data, which has been well-documented. You know, people depressed die about half, you know, uh, you know, 50% shorter lifespan. So we need to make sure that we're advocating in a way that we're using words that they're going to listen to. And what I like to say is we want to maximize the Velcro effect, which is everything we say sticks and minimize the Teflon effect, which means everything we say just kind of slides right off. When we talk about psychopathology and all those things, that tends to, that's kind of on that, that Teflon side that people hear and they don't even know what that means. So they just kind of forget it as opposed to saying how this can save money, how it's going to get votes. We got one politician. I said, what's going to help you get votes if you can do put this program through and this is why. That maximizes that Velcro effect. And if it sticks, then it's likely to have an impact, not only now, but maybe down the road a bit. Well, thank you very much for sharing experiences. The, those are really valuable for us, especially for your success and for your failures. We also got very valuable lessons from them. And I, as far as, as, far as I get my suggestions, like using the wording, it's very important and advocating for mental health is very important. And I also, we have the advantage of science behind that, that the scientific like uh, literature now revealing importance, like important results, how the like mental health affecting also uh, reproductive health, how cancer, cardiovascular diseases and so and how those are uh, associated with, I mean, hormonal, uh, the, the hormonal changes during menstrual cycle, how those affected obstetric those are related more more of seen as related with obstetrics and gynecologists or endocrinologists but also really affects mental health of uh, patients so those are also raising awareness among healthcare workers and also those are very important for us and also make our hands especially powerful while advocating for mental health uh, those were one of uh, my points from your from the discussion and thank and you very much again may i may i ask two of you uh, our young friends if you were the uh, deans of uh, medical schools uh, at the same place or different places after having heard these valuable thoughts uh, what would your first step be about uh, medical education and especially psychiatry education in your medical school? Well, I found the interdisciplinary panels and discussions very, uh, how to say, very effective in case of those uh, objectives. Uh, for example, in a like uh, obstetrics and gynecology collection, we should have seen a psychiatrist or mental health professional who also state the importance of mental health in uh, women that the like uh, mental health problems related with pr uh, pregnancy, but also the hormonal changes affecting the mental health of a woman. And when you like became an obstetric or gynecologist or even a GP, you should recognize those and uh, like refer or treat those accordingly. Those panels. Those integrated uh, education model, I think, really helps in case of, uh, uh, in case of like implementing uh, the importance of mental health into curriculum. So I should advocate and uh, encourage those kind of education models in our in in my uh, school curriculum. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Hassan, what would you do? That's a hard question for me, and probably I will integrate the uh, psychiatry committee and uh, the um, basic level uh, lessons. And uh, in every uh, year, 
and the every student will um, work with the psychiatrist after the um, their um, module lessons, uh, like um, endocrine lessons. And after the lessons, they will go to the psychiatrist and they'll talk about the, uh, their symptoms uh, in psychiatric system. Uh, and I will uh, integrate their systems and uh, I wanna um, make a new approach um, with integrated system. So probably that's it. And I will um, I will advocate uh, to do, make a policy paper in EMSA or FMSA to advocate the medical students about the this um, situation and make a, a lot of um, events about the situation in everywhere on the world. So if we teach the um, medical students, we will create a new uh, generation of doctors and that will be important for all the uh, other things. Thank you. Yes, and, and I just one uh, suggestion that came into my mind. And also, I wish I could uh, like heard the term biopsychosocial bio model in the earlier uh, years in my medical school. I think it's a really important term to like learn and I mean, like feel the term and how to like integrate it into clinical practice. So I wish I could uh heard it earlier and i i also suggest my educators to like when when uh, like students came into a uh, medical school it, at the basic level they also should heard about biopsychosocial model and how to like treat how to see patients as a whole and like the the, the importance of holistic medicine in this case that that's also uh would be one of my suggestions I can share something at, at my university. What we have is, it's called Interprofessional Education, IPE. So we have eight different health professions as part of Western U. Nursing, dentistry, uh, medicine, we've got uh, PT, OT, quite a number of them. Every single student from the first day they start their first year, they get together. We have students from, when we break up into the, in the groups from each of our different colleges, different disciplines, and they have a standardized case that is really one that really integrates the biopsychosocial. And they do that for a whole six months. They come in, so they learn from each other and they see where well, someone's got diabetes, but they weren't, they, you know, they were living in an area where it was tough to get healthy, nutritious food. So they were eating junk food. And then one of them, one of the cases we had, it was a woman who had young children who didn't, couldn't get childcare. So she couldn't get her kids, she couldn't get there. And what we did is try to use actual cases that we came up with where the students together talk to each other. We have nursing students, social work students, uh, PT, OT, and they all discuss the case. But what we try to do is not just say biopsychosocial, but make it become alive. Let them be able to see it, not just use the words, but understand the concepts. And I, I think it's something that, that it's worth considering. We've, we've talked about kind of uh, incorporating this as, as uh, Rachel and, and Boulant know, we used to always fight for, well, we need more time to teach psychiatry. We always got less and less. We'd get 10 hours and then it went to eight hours or whatever. And I think what we need to do now is get more time to integrate this so that we can demonstrate from the very, from the day a medical student steps on campus that, and again, Dave Goldberg, we talked about, and Linda and others at Manchester have done this, that we really need to, and that I think we have a chance of starting to change the culture in a way where people understand what this means and not just react to the terms without really having a good, uh, you know, a good, a good database to kind of change behavior and attitudes. Thank you, Dave. The, the things uh, our young colleagues say are not dreams, but they are going to be the reality in the coming future. Uh, so uh, you will be watching this maybe after 10 years or 20 years, and you'll, you'll find yourself, well, I have already said this. Uh, I mean, or we may not be there to watch it then, but uh, we hope you will do that. Rachel, what would you like to add if we are coming to the end of our session? 
Um, yes, yeah, well, thank you. It's been most interesting and um, and stimulating for me as well, having this discussion. So, um, so thank you, all of you. Um, it was to add to what David said about when well, all of you have been saying about integrating um, student training um, is, and I think David was describing this too. It, in there's a need to integrate the continuing professional development as well, so that people don't have these little silo courses, say on you know malaria, HIV, diabetes, or heart attacks, or whatever. It should be integrated. Those should be integrated with mental health as well, so that um, so that people see these um, complex relationships. Um, um, all the time. Otherwise, they're constantly being encouraged into separate silos. Um, so, so it's a task to do it not just across the medical schools, but across the um, the hospitals and the public health systems as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, let me uh, ask you, uh, our young fellows, once more, your last suggestions or questions or words before coming to the end of this session. Well, I said it more than once in this uh, like uh, meeting, but I, I again say it, I thank you very much. This was very stimulating and I have now full of ideas to do in future and that's the points in my mind. Uh, thank you very much <laughs> for having me in this meeting too. Thanks. And uh, thanks for this uh, event and uh, this inspired me. And I, I have a, I decided to make a, a policy paper in uh, EMSA about this holistic uh, management of uh, patient treatment. Uh, in EMSA, we made a lot of uh, policy paper about uh, public health, health policy, and other uh, pillars. And we will um, share our papers uh, with the European Commission. And this is the first uh, work I will do it after this uh, event. And thanks for all the speeches. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, David, please. I don't think there's much else to say. I think what we need to do is walk the walk and talk the talk. We've talked a lot about how important this is. Um, we've tried to share with you our passion for this field. But uh, as Bulan said, now it's up to you. Um, and, and I think hopefully it'll be a little bit easier job because we will have uh, science behind us, but we always need to understand that um, it's not what we teach, it's what our students learn, whoever that student might be, and that it's more than just the cognitive knowledge, that not only is it the biopsychosocial, but we need to know that what changes behavior is not only cognition, but it's you know how somebody feels about it or their affect if they're completely against it, and then, um, you know, kind of their motor behavior. So if they say, yeah, I know we should do this and I think it's good, but if they don't change their behavior, then we've really not done anything. So it's the cognitive, the affective and the psychomotor uh, that we need to integrate, just like we integrate the biopsychosocial. I'm so thrilled to hear that you're inspired by this and you're motivated by it. And that, that was the most important part of the whole session that you will take the baton and keep moving forward because I think we all agree that th this isn't just our own personal agenda. This is really at the core of quality healthcare delivery. So th thank you for, for joining and, and sharing that your newfound enthusiasm for this. Yeah. Uh, any, anything you want to add, Rachel? Uh, well, it's very heartening to listen to these to students, it's very, um, very exciting. So um, anything that David and I can do to um, support, yes, and Abulent, yes, um, would be terrific. And I just wanted to say thank you all for, um, for a very nice session. Well, thank you. While closing, I will uh, remind once more on 10th of October, uh, starting from uh, 8 a.m. Central European time uh, for three hours, we will have a Zoom party, uh, the second Zoom party. 
Uh, I hope uh, students who are following or will be watching this will attend. Of course, you two and uh, David and Rachel are uh, most welcome or they are already part of that, that activity. Uh, well, thanks a lot for all the contributions.